Hello everyone, welcome to another video on this channel. The topic of this video is star trails photography and I'll be talking about the in the field techniques I use to capture star trail photos like this one here for example and yeah, the video I now show you is part of a start to finish tutorial about star trails photography which is available on my homepage and yeah it's the chapter about how I take the photos in the field, how I took the photos for this photo and yeah, let's just get into it and yeah, if you're interested in the processing, just head over to my homepage. I leave a link in the description below and yeah, there you can get the complete tutorial. So let's get started. So let's start this tutorial with a little introduction on how I took this photo in the field and in general how you can take star trail photos. So first of all, there's usually the planning and there are kind of two ways you could plan a star trail photo. So the most common way is, or what you see most of the time in star trails photos is, you want to create a star trail photo where you have the stars rotate around Polaris. So you have this complete circle in the sky. And if you want to do a star trail photo like this, what you do, you first find the direction in which you can capture the stars rotating around Polaris. And in a second step, you search for an appropriate foreground for appropriate subject. For me it was a bit different. I already had the subject I wanted to photograph, which are those beautiful mountains here. And I also found a good foreground to complement those. So there wasn't so much I could do about the direction of the photo. And here what I check is basically if the star trails would fit with the subject and also what length of uh, star trails I would need to complement what I already have set up here with the mountains and the foreground. And the outcome of such a planning could be that it wouldn't work and yeah, that the Star Trek photo wouldn't fit here. But yeah, in my case, fortunately, I found that the direction of the stars and also the length I would be able to capture would work quite nice with the subject, like falling stars and coming in here from the left side and bending towards the mountains. If the star trails would not have worked here, what I could have done was I could have photographed shorter exposures of the stars, trying to get pinpoint stars, so basically starry sky without any trails, and I could have blended this with the foreground. And what I like to do to plan a star trail photo is I use a tool called Planet Pro, which I can use to get a very good impression of how a photo would look with stars trailing above the scene. So here I have basically set up or pinpointed the area where I want to take the photo. And uh, then I set the focal length. In this case, I was at 17 millimeters. And also I set two markers on the mountains, which you see in the photo. So the big mountain in the center and then there's also a little needle mountain on the left side. So I mark those because this gives me an idea of the scene when I go to the VR mode. With this here in place and also set the right date and roughly the right time, I can then check how the star trails would look. So this is here the VR view of uh, the scene. So here you again see the markers so in this VR view, you don't see the exact shapes of the mountains, which is why it's important to just set some markers on the map. So this is the big mountain. That's the little needle to the left. And this gives me an idea how the star trails would look. And you see, as in the photo here, the stars coming from the left upper side, bending towards the bigger mountain, and then here going nearly straight. So this made the decision for me that it would work with the star trails and yeah, later when I came back to capture those, I just took many photos to ensure that I get the right length of the stars. And I think this is now also the right time to talk a bit about the camera settings and how I actually captured this photo of the star trials. So the first thing, this was taken at night in the evening around 11 or 11.30. So what I did first to make sure I capture enough details in the foreground, I took some photos just after the sun had set at twilight. And yeah, please ignore the 
color shifts here for example for this one it's still a cooler color balance here i have a little bit of a warmer balance it's just because i use auto white balance um, which yeah i'm just too lazy to set it to a specific white balance and since i shoot raw i can easily adjust this later in raw processing which i'll do also later but yeah first looking at those photos i captured them just as the sun had set also here you see a bit of a twilight glow and yeah what i did i took photos for focus taking so this one was focused very close to the foreground then a focus on the bush here then at the background and finally capturing bracketed exposures to get in the whole dynamic range here and yeah my thinking was capturing this photo at twilight where we have this beautiful orange glow going on i would use this even in the final blend and the final photo which you see here because having some detail in the foreground you need the light source and my thinking was if i would use a bit of that glow here this could serve as the light source for this foreground so giving me the light i need and then having light coming in from the other side and blending it together it's kind of a surreal image so not completely realistic for sure but had i had the sky completely dark it would also not have looked too good because where should the light have come from for the foreground so this is why such a time blending as i would call it looks quite interesting because here we have the light giving the details in the foreground and then here we have the night coming in so it's basically capturing time of that evening yeah, and maybe one important thing about capturing those images for the foreground and the landscape make sure that the light is very even so once the sun has set or before the sun rises in the morning when you still have that even light without any shadows you can use this to capture the foreground and yeah later you just adjust the white balance to fit your nighttime image or your sky so once i take the photos for the foreground and the landscape i had to wait nearly three hours until it was dark enough to capture the stars so what i did here was just leaving the tripod in place knowing how to put the camera on it again there are some scales on my ball head and on the camera on the tripod plate so i could precisely adjust the camera again later so then took the camera back to cam which was just 500 meters away had some dinner then just spent the night watching a bit as the moon went over the landscape and finally as the moon set yeah then it got dark enough and i returned to that place so now let's talk about camera settings remember the exposure triangle where you have the shutter speed the iso and the aperture and the combination of those three settings basically makes your exposure defines the depth of field in the image but since i already took photos for the foreground i don't have to worry about depth of field at all so i can just focus on using those settings to get the star trails to look right let's first look at iso and aperture which determine the amount of star trails in your final image an open aperture combined with a high ISO setting, for example 2600 or higher, will create a densely populated sky which will contain many star trails relatively close to each other. Mind that you will also have to deal with more noise if you increase the ISO. As already said, using an open aperture doesn't bother us. The shutter depth of field is not important because we already captured all the foreground the only thing you have to make sure if you shoot with an open aperture is that you focus properly so really making sure that your stars are properly in focus if on the other hand you stop down a bit and use lower isos you get a darker sky with less star trails and yet to find the right setting you should do a few test shots at different isos and apertures and yet check in the preview how many stars are visible at the different settings and how bright they appear in the image then you need to pre-visualize how a star trail photo with each setting would look and yet in general the sky will appear much brighter than in the single exposure because yeah, you suddenly get those star trails and the sky gets filled much more and you need a bit of experience to find out which settings generally work best for you so best head out and do a few test shots here's some additional pointers to decide how many stars you want in the sky for example 
If you have a relatively clean foreground with not too much details, you don't need that many stars. A cleaner sky will work best. If you have a very detailed foreground with much going on, lots of contrast, then you could also use a bit more detail in the sky to balance it. Now let's talk about exposure time. Remember the 500 rule, which helps you to calculate the maximum exposure time you can expose at a given focal length to still get pinpoint stars in your photo. If you basically exceed this calculated time, you get star trails. So any time longer than that gives you star trails in your photo. One approach to photographing star trails would just be to take one very long exposure, half an hour or an hour, to give you star trails in a single exposure. But this is not the approach I prefer and also not the approach I did in this image because it's not very flexible and you really have to get things right. The technique I use is basically taking many photos with exposure times between 30 seconds and 120 seconds. And in my example here it was 120 seconds and I later combine all the individual frames. This approach allows me much more flexibility. I can set the length of the star trails later in post-processing by just selecting a few of the images or by selecting all of the images. And I also don't have to deal with that much hot pixels on the image because the exposure is not that long. And there's also one thing you can do if you take many photos with those shorter exposures. In some softwares you can create kind of a comet effect where you have the star trails fade in from the side. And I can later show you what this is in the software. So since we now determine the length of the star trails by the number of exposures and not the individual exposure time of the frames, the only important thing when selecting the exposure time is how bright you want the sky to look. I, for example, like it if the sky is not 100% black. So as in this image here, if I have a very soft, light in the sky and yeah this gives me more room later in color grading because a very black sky it's hard to color grade so the longer i expose the brighter the sky will look also depending on if you have some light pollution in the sky and the more i can do with it in post so for this image here or for all those individual images you see here i used an exposure time of 120 seconds and I had my camera set to f4, which is as open as my lens goes, and I was using ISO 800. So this is really the most I would use on my 5DSR. And you see, it's not that many stars here as if I had taken those photos with a higher ISO. And I already showed you the comparison. For example, with ISO 6400, I would have had much more stars but also much more noise. So this here was a good compromise for me also with 120 seconds, giving me just a little bit of light and also the silhouette of the mountains. So as for the settings here, I had everything on manual. I used a cable release and the barb timer of my camera to set a fixed 120 second exposure. And then I fired away 12 photos and what was very important, a dark frame. So here you have the 12 photos, each one 120 seconds. And then for the last photo, I put on the landscape and with the same settings, I took a dark frame. And this is important because with 120 seconds, I already get a few or quite a few hot pixels with my 5DSR. And I use this dark frame later to subtract those hot pixels, which I'll also show you in post later. Yeah, and one other very important thing is disable any timers in your camera. So if you have a two second release timer, disable it. And if you have any other mirror lock timers, which I can set up on my 5DSR to reduce shake, remove anything which delays the exposure because otherwise you'll get very tiny gaps in the star trails, which you get anyway, because there's always a little bit of a gap. But yeah, if you have timers, those will get bigger and it will be harder for the software to later remove those gaps. And now that we have finished talking about how I captured all the photos and how you can capture the right photos for your star trails, 
it's time to finally move on to the post-processing, which we'll start in the next video with the pre-processing right here in Lightroom.